According to Mark Schilling from the Japan Times, Ultraman is a rite of passage for Japanese boys and a few girls and their families, as much a part of the national fabric as Fury Kake and Chopsticks. Or, according to Hayao Miyazaki, it's an institution that helped to ruin an entire generation of Japanese youth. Regardless of which take you go with, there's no denying the immense impact of the Ultra series. Japanese media is filled with countless tributes and parodies to the pop culture juggernaut. Bulma from Dragon Ball uses the attacks of Ultra 7, as does Aqua in the second season of Konosuba, God's blessing on this wonderful world. The title credits of 1999's Digimon Adventure resembles the monster silhouettes from the opening credits of the early Ultraman shows. One of those title screens features a character doing the iconic Ultraman transformation pose, and Greymon seems to have taken a cue or two from Gamora. Then even Godzilla once struck an Ultraman pose. But the love for Ultraman isn't limited to the East. Will Smith is a huge fan of the original Ultraman, and Way Big from Ben 10 is a reference to the series. Does Way Big species being Tokustar sound familiar? Tokusatsu anyone? But minor nods or jokes are not the focus here. Today we will be looking exclusively at Japanese media that drew a significant amount of influence from the Ultra series. Let's get this started. If you believe Pokemon Mastermind Satoshi Tajiri only drew influence from bug catching to create the biggest media franchise in the world today, then you're sorely mistaken. During a November 1999 interview with Time Magazine, Tajiri said the following, I'm part of the first generation who grew up with manga and anime, you know, after Godzilla. I was absorbed with Ultraman on TV and in manga. The profession of game designer was created really recently. If it didn't exist, I'd probably be making anime. He continued, Places to catch insects are rare because of urbanization. Kids play inside their homes now, and a lot had forgotten about catching insects. So had I. When I was making games, something clicked, and I decided to make a game with that concept. Everything I did as a kid is kind of rolled into one. That's what Pokemon is. Playing video games, watching TV, Ultraman with his capsule monsters. They all became ingredients for the game. So yes, catching bugs was a part of it. But notice, he also mentioned watching Ultraman with his capsule monsters. Before running into copyright issues, Pokemon was to be called Capsule Monsters, something reflected in the earliest concept material for the series. Capsule Monsters is the same name as the characters in 1967's Ultra 7. In said show, Dan, the alter ego of Ultra 7, carried around capsules which contained creatures he could summon to fight his battles. Windham, Although he was shown to have more capsules, and in other media he uses additional monsters, Dan only uses three monsters throughout the original Ultra 7 series. Hmm, maybe that's one of the reasons why there are three starter Pokemon. But wait, there's more. At least several Pokemon seem to draw a great deal of influence from Ultra Monsters. To name a few examples, Golem and Rhydon look an awful lot like two enemies from Return of Ultraman, Tatkon and Sigarath. While other kaiju properties, like the Godzilla and Gamera series, have influenced Pokemon too, when it comes to Tokusatsu, nothing else compares to what the Ultra series did for Pokemon. Hmm, need another example or two? Birdie the Mighty started as a manga series in 1985 and, in the years since, has gone on to receive additional manga adaptations as well as two anime adaptations, those being an OVA series in the late 90s and a two-season television series in the late 2000s. While, to my knowledge, there are no hard sources linking Birdie the Mighty to Ultraman, the influence seems undeniable. Plus, Birdie the Mighty series creator Masami Yuki would have been a child during the kaiju boom of both the late 60s and early 70s, the perfect age for media like Ultraman to leave a strong impression. If Birdie the Mighty was inspired by any specific Ultra property, it is almost certainly the original Ultraman, because while Ultraman reviving dead Earthlings is commonplace throughout the series, the hero being responsible for the death of a human is unique to the original show. Here's how it goes. Ultraman, as introduced in the first episode of the 1966 show, was a space officer chasing a runaway criminal. The pursuit led him to Earth, and during this pursuit, Ultraman accidentally kills Shin Hayata. To make amends for his mistake, Ultraman merges his life force with Hayata. This allows Hayata to carry on with his life as usual. But in times of trouble, such as when giant monsters or aliens are at large, he can use the beta capsule to become Ultraman. Much like Ultraman, 
Birdie is a space officer who accidentally kills a human while in pursuit of a criminal, Sinkawa in her case. And like Ultraman, to amend for her mistakes, Birdie merges her life force with Sinkawa and from that point on, they are two minds within one body. Just like the relationship between Ultraman and Hayata, Sinkawa can transform into Birdie whenever the going gets rough, like when battling one of the mini aliens or robot baddies. Beyond obvious differences like Birdie being a young woman and not a giant, this is where things diverge. The original Ultraman show does little to nothing with the concept of two characters sharing a body. In Birdie the Mighty, the dynamic between Birdie and Sinkawa is one of the most prominent features and truly helps to make the series its own thing. Evangelion has countless other influences and is very much its own beast. Still, Ultraman is easily one of the biggest sources of inspiration for Evangelion. Series creator Hideaki Anno once said he wouldn't be doing what he does today without Ultraman. The entire concept of a military organization defending the world against aliens and monsters, the cores and time limits of the Evangelions, and even the visual style and direction can all be traced directly back to Ultraman. Zerulel, the 14th Angel, is without a doubt based on the final enemy of Ultraman, Zetan. And maybe Anno's fixation with crosses in Christianity started with Ultraman. Ultraman's signature pose resembles a cross, and plenty of other Christian elements can be found throughout the series. This is normally attributed to the Catholic faith of series creator and master of Japanese special effects, Eiji Tsuburaya. Rebuild of Evangelion drives the Ultra influence home further. Like the Science Patrol and Ultraman, hmm. Misato has the King Adora cackle as her ringtone. In the second Rebuild film, Isato drives the same type of cards that the Monster Attack team does in Return of Ultraman, and the number on her front license plate is the year that Return of Ultraman made its debut. In the same film, the Giants of Light resemble the Ultra Brothers, and the signs of Ultra can be seen on the floor during the preview scene at the end. Last but not least, the logo for Anno's studio, Studio Kara, is accompanied by the Ultraman transformation sound effect. But this probably shouldn't be too surprising for the man who played Ultraman twice in fan films during his college years and recently wrote and produced Shin Ultraman, an official Ultra production set for a 2022 release. And there you are. This video only covers a small selection of the media that the Ultra series has inspired since its mid-60s debut. There are numerous other examples of the influence of the Ultra series on Japanese media and international pop culture. So, which of the properties covered here is your favorite? Or what's something that wasn't included in the video? Share your thoughts below and if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more like it, give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel. Your support is appreciated and hopefully we'll see you next time. Until then, take care.